Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. Well, 2021 just keeps getting more and more interesting, doesn't it? As I'm recording this, of course, we're just a few days past January 6th when the world saw an invasion of the U.S. Capitol building. I keep thinking of that Asian proverb. I think it's a blessing, actually. May you live in interesting times. Well, these times are getting a little too interesting and maybe even a little scary. But remember, Red Sneaker writers, books provide solace and inspiration. Books are where people turn not only just to escape, but also when they're seeking comfort and wisdom. That's why we write these things, and that's why you need to keep writing. My interview guest of honor for this podcast is Liz Berry. Liz has been on the podcast before, and I couldn't wait to get her back. She, of course, is the publisher of 1001 Dark Nights and the Blue Box Press. She is a marketing expert and, of course, is also married to the last podcast guest, Steve Berry. She's going to talk on how you build your brand, which is kind of just a fancy way of saying how to attract more attention to your books in 2021. And believe me, there is no one who knows more about it than Liz, because she's lived with it and she's done it very successfully. But first, the news. Speaking of what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, because I think everybody's going to for a long time, Simon & Schuster has announced that they are canceling a book they acquired by Missouri Republican Senator Josh Hawley. This was going to be a book called, well, it still will be a book called The Tyranny of Big Tech that was scheduled to come out in June. But in the immediate aftermath of what happened in the Capitol on January 6th, they announced that they were not going to publish the book. Hawley, just to give a a factual and non-political summary for those who may not know, was one of the people, he's a leader in the Senate, a leader of the effort to overturn the results of the Electoral College, even after the insurrection. And he has also been accused of helping incite the mob. He's he's reportedly been witnessed before the attack, waving, giving thumbs up signals to the to the invaders and raising his fist in solidarity with the crowd that was gathering in front of the Capitol building. Allegedly, in the aftermath of this event, Simon and Schuster. Now, if you've been following this podcast, you know Simon and Schuster is in the process of being acquired by Penguin Random House. Anyway, they've canceled his book. They say they made the decision, quote, after witnessing the disturbing, deadly insurrection that took place on Wednesday in Washington, D.C. We did not come to this decision lightly. As a publisher, it will always be our mission to amplify a variety of voices and viewpoints. At the same time, we take seriously our larger public responsibility as citizens and cannot support Senator Hawley after his role in what became a dangerous threat to our democracy and freedom, end quote. This really is news because uh, even as long as I have been in this business and world, which is (laughs) a while, I have never seen anything like this before. Now, this year we have seen books be canceled because a Twitter storm arose, you know, because somebody felt that the book uh, played on uh, racist uh, tropes or stereotypes. But this move was made uh, before the Twitter storm, if you will, very soon after the event. And I assume it has a financial price. I don't think Simon & Schuster could have acquired this book without paying him in advance, probably a significant one. And they're never going to get that back. They may try. 
but it will be a futile effort. And so they're basically taking a financial hit to not publish this book. Will that prevent it from being published? Of course not. He'll find someone else to do it, probably a smaller non-New York publishing house, possibly a a smaller regional press that specializes in right-wing material. And there are several. Some have speculated that it could be picked up by HarperCollins because they're ultimately owned by the Australian News Corp, which also owns Fox News. But I bet it doesn't go that way. I bet it's a smaller press. But anyway, anyway, this is significant to see a book canceled like this in the wake of what people are obviously perceiving as a serious threat to democracy. On happier news, I reported last time uh, that there have been great increases in the sale of books during 2020, despite the lockdown, even for print books, which saw about an 8 to 9% increase. Some are saying now NPD Bookscan is reporting that uh, print unit sales through retail outlets improved 12% over 2019. Now, uh, NPD Bookscan primarily just reports data given to them by publishers of books sold through retail outlets. So, for instance, Amazon is not included. And Amazon sells more than 50% of all books out there. So uh, maybe that's a reason for the discrepancy. But to think that print books sales went up significantly during a year when most bookstores were closed and most libraries were closed, and yet retail sales still increased, that's pretty remarkable and does suggest what I said before, that in tough times, people turn to books. And the only thing that has shown sales even better than that would, of course, be the audio market, which continues to grow at record rates. Currently, audiobooks are increasing, depending on the year, 15 to 25 percent every year, and podcasts are increasing about 25 to 30 percent every year, which is why in the past year we saw Spotify making significant acquisitions to get into the podcast market, moving away from music, where uh, they seem to have great success, but apparently that's not as profitable as they'd like, moving into the audiobook and podcast world. Amazon has also announced that it's starting its own unlisten unlimited listening subscription plan, which will be called Audible Plus, kind of like Kindle Unlimited, but for audiobooks. And they recently acquired a company called Wondery, that's W-O-N-D-E-R-Y, which is a podcast production company. Why are they doing it? Because analysts believe that there is a large market for spoken word be it audiobooks or podcasts or anything else that is remaining untapped, or if not untapped, not exploited to the degree that it could be. And book publishers may be missing out on some profits here. Authors may be missing out on some profits here if they're not active with audiobooks or podcasts or other firms. I've got a friend writer who is doing the audiobook of his own book, but releasing a chapter every week as sort of a serialized podcast. That's smart. Macmillan, the publishing house, has launched a podcast division. This is in a book publisher, and that was like four years ago. So here's the good news for Red Sneaker writers. More opportunities. This could be more ways to, you know, uh, open new markets for books you've already written, uh, audiobooks, podcast distribution, whatever. Now, if you're going to go with somebody like Audible Plus or Spotify, you're going to end up having to sign exclusivity agreements. But it is another option. Bottom line, Red Sneaker writers, retain your audiobook rights and find some way to use them if you're not making most of this huge surge in audio sales, you're not doing right by yourself. You're leaving money on the table for no good reason. The hard work writing the book is already done. Now make the most of it. One last story 
January 1 may be New Year's to all the other people out there, but for writers, it's Public Domain Day. Because each year, under U.S. copyright law, more books come into the public domain based upon when they were first published. Now, books first published in 1925 are in the public domain, which means, for instance, The Great Gatsby. You may have heard of that one. You may have had to read it in high school. (laughs) And it's actually a great book. It's now in the public domain, which means you can quote from it all you want. Ditto for Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, which is also a fine, fine book, and a lot of other modernist classics, early Ernest Hemingway. Theodore Dreiser's American Tragedy, uh, some of the early Agatha Christie, and many more. Often at retreats or writer con, people ask me, what can I do? You know, can I mention a title? Of course you can. Can I quote from a book? Can I quote a song lyric? Usually the rule of thumb is that a few words, or in the case of a song, a line, that's okay. Of course, what's a line? Is that a sentence? Is that a musical phrase? Nobody's really quite sure. But if you go too far, you're going to be expected to pay licensing fees unless it's in the public domain. Many years ago, I was doing a book called Extreme. I think it was Extreme. I think it was Extreme Justice uh, for Random House, now Penguin Random House, the Ballantine Division. And I found this lyric from a Mary Chapin Carpenter song. It was just perfect. It was the most lovely poetic expression of what the book was all about in my heart. So I put that, you know, in the front of the manuscript just to see what happened, would happen. And and my editor didn't say anything. Nobody's. And then, you know, like a couple months before the book was actually published, I got a call from somebody in the accounting division who said, Bill, I just wanted to tell you, we checked it out, and there's no problem with using that Carpenter quote. It's going to cost $800, but we'll just deduct that from your royalties. And I said, uh, 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 you know, I I, I think I've found something better. Never mind that. And then I replaced the song lyric with a quote from an old dead guy. Not that I'm a cheapskate or anything, but, I mean, sometimes, Red Sneaker writers, you just got to be smart. In the writing tips section this time, I'm going to encourage all you Red Sneaker writers to think ahead and make plans for 2021, because usually when you've got a plan, just like having an outline for a novel, you're much more likely to actually get it done. Now, when you hear this podcast, you may have already made New Year's resolutions, but you can still add a few. I think, you know, any time in January is still game. And if none of your resolutions has involved your writing life or your potential writing career, that's a mistake. Uh, Liz, in the interview today, is going to be talking about how to improve your marketing in 2021. I just published a blog on my website, which is about how the book world will change in 2021. And you're welcome to go check that out. If you get the Red Sneaker newsletter, you've already seen it and much more. And if you're not getting the Red Sneaker newsletter, what is your problem? I mean, come on, it's free. Just go to my website and sign up for it. You get freebies when you sign up. Or if you don't want to do that, just send me an email, wb at williambernhardt.com, and I'll add you to the mailing list. Anyway, we're all looking ahead, and you may be giving some thought to what you're going to write or how you're going to make your writing career happen, or how you'd like to grow your career. So I'm going to suggest three questions here that I want you to think about to put this in perspective. It's basically why, boss, and rights. And because that may not be completely self-explanatory, let me give you a little bit more detail on these three questions. Number one, the big, most important one, why? Why do you write? Or to put it differently, what do you want? We talk on this podcast, writing tips section, a lot about writing style. 
And in the news section, we talk about publishing itself and the business and the money aspect, what's selling and what's not, what's driving you to do one of the most difficult things a person could possibly do, try and write a book. I think it's important work, but it is seriously difficult work. Why are you doing it? What do you want? Is it financial success? Because, and I'm not trying to be a downer, but there are a lot easier ways of making money out there. I'm not going to name names, but you know there are. You know it. The hand, Yeah, there are some, a handful of people who seriously break out and make major league money But that is relatively rare. And again, not trying to discourage you from trying at all, just saying, be realistic. And and of course, if that is what's driving you, then that dictates what kind of book you should be writing. Is it popularity you're looking for, personal or for your work? You know, if that's the way, then you need to be in the world of popular fiction. On the other hand, I think some people are looking for uh, the sense of being literary. They want to have literary or critical or academic success, the feeling that they've written something of merit, something that will be praised in the New York Times book review. You need to figure out why you're writing. What is it you want? And then pick your project accordingly. You know, it's pointless to pick one project, finish it, and then later complain because You know, it didn't turn out the way you wanted. If you're writing a literary novel, I don't think it's legit afterwards to complain, well, sales weren't as good as I wanted them to. You didn't write the right book for that. Similarly, if you write popular fiction, I don't think there's any point a year later in complaining, well, you know, I didn't get the critical reviews I wanted. You weren't pandering to those people. You weren't writing their kind of book. Figure out what you want. That is the threshold question, not only for writing success, but for your personal happiness, for achieving what it is you want to achieve. Okay, I've made my point. Question number two, boss, do you want a boss? Can you stand to have a boss? (laughs) Or do you want to do your own thing? This, of course, leads to the next question after you've decided what you're going to write. How's it going to be published? Are you going to go the traditional publishing route, which has some advantages and disadvantages? Are you going to go with a large publisher or a smaller or regional one? Or are you going to try and have an indie success? Publish it yourself or with a small consortium of other writers? What do you want? And do you want to have a boss? Because just to make it clear, even though All you've done is license your publishing rights. If you give those rights to a publisher, you've got a boss, somebody who is going to ultimately make the threshold decisions about cover, editing, title, how the book is marketed, and a million other things. Whereas if you go the indie route, you can make all those decisions yourself, whether you want to or not. I mean, I'll be honest, I can live with a boss. I don't really like having a boss. (laughs) I practiced as a lawyer in a big law firm for more than a decade and actually had one of the best bosses ever. But I'd still rather make my own decisions and set my own schedule and pick my projects for myself. Similarly, uh, all those books that that I did uh, for Random House, you know, came with the caveat that I was writing what they wanted to publish. Do you want to have a boss or do you want to be in charge? And then the third threshold question writes, are you willing to give away your publishing rights, the right to publish your work? You've spent a long time writing it. Now what? Just to be clear, if you license it to, say, a big house, you've given them the right to publish it, and you may not, probably won't, ever get it back. Most contracts do not have term clauses, although I advocate it, but that's difficult to get, especially when you're working with a big publishing house. They've got a lot of power and money, and you've got zero clout. You just want to be published. You're probably not going to get that. Is the book going to go out of print? No, never, because ebooks don't go out of print. 
even print books don't go out of print now. They just get set up at, for, in print on demand, uh, you know, or, or outfits. So are you willing to give away your rights? Don't do it unless you're getting something in return, especially in the publishing world we have today where everything is changing with the speed of sound. I've said before, it's like the wild, wild west out there because everything changes every day. You know, ebook rights used to be worth nothing. Now they're the big deal. Audiobooks used to be a tiny niche market. Now they're a big deal. And you can't participate in any of these things if you've given away your rights. So don't do it unless you've got a very good reason and you get something in return. Similarly, when you're picking your project, you know, if you decide you want to go independent route, have the right book for that. Popular fiction, genre fiction does very well as ebook. Uh, not always, of course, but what I'm trying to say is that those are what people have successes with, those kinds of books, easily recognized as being part of a genre, science fiction or fantasy. And there are you know, 600 different kinds of fantasy now, but it's fantasy. There's romances, many flavors of that, too. There's crime, mystery, cozies, hardboard, thrillers. But those recognizable genres are where people do best with self-publishing and indie publishing. If you want to write something else, you probably are looking at a different route. Take all of these questions into account. You know, why am I writing? Do I want a boss? Can I stand to give away my publishing rights? And make an informed decision. There's no one right answer here. There, it's not necessarily that this path is better than some other path. You've just got to figure out what's right for you because writing books is hard and it's time consuming. And if at the end of the day, it's not going to make you happy, then you should be doing something else. So figure out what's going to make you happy, going to make you happy. And more importantly, figure out what you can stand to do for an extended period of time. So you can have not only a book, but the writing career that you want to have. My guest this time is Liz Berry, publisher extraordinaire, publisher of A Thousand and One Dark Nights, which are racking up major sales. Same for the Blue Box Press. And she comes from a background in marketing and sales and understands this better than most of the people in the business. And here's what she has to say. Liz, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I love being on this podcast. Uh, it's always great to talk to you. So here's my traditional first question. If you were going to give one piece of advice to an aspiring author, what would it be? I think that for an aspiring author, the biggest piece of advice I can give them is that brand building, which they must have, mm -hmm. is premeditated and strategic. Well, that's really good because I, I, I know, and who blames them, but a lot of people that I see in my small group retreats or at the conference every year love books. They love reading, so they decide to try writing something, but don't give much, if any, thought to where am I going with this? I agree. I, I meet a lot of um, authors as well, and I'm, I don't talk about the craft of writing. There are plenty of people, including yourself, who can do that, but what saddens me is that writers spend so much time on polishing their book, writing their book, thinking about the story, thinking about every aspect of it, but they spend about five minutes thinking about how to brand themselves and how to market it. And, you know, a book is new to someone who's never heard of it before. That's absolutely true. But how are you going to get them to hear about it? Right. And, and so often the frustration people are experiencing, you know, can't find an agent, can't get it published. Mm -hmm could be remedy with just a, a small amount of prior thought about, like you say, branding or uh, genre or positioning. How am I going to sell this? But I agree. I agree. Liz, I know that you have been involved with book marketing for, oh yeah, what, about 15 years, I'm going to say? Yeah, about 15. Crazy to be in this business that I remember when there were no eBooks. I mean, you do too. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. 
and you were involved in marketing even before that. Uh, I know yes. you have mm -hmm. formed some opinions about what authors should and should not do. So let me ask it this way. What should every author have? That's a great question. And I hope that your listeners really get something out of um, what I'm going to share because I've, I've taken a lot of time to think about this. None of this is hard. They just have to think about it. So the first thing they have to remember is in marketing, it does take seven times of seeing something in different ways before a reader will heed the call to action. So you might say, well, how, what are those seven things? Well, we've got some examples. Uh, the first one would be a website. Everybody needs a website. I know that, that you would say, well, of course, Liz, everybody knows they need a website. But here are a few points about the website. Their bio on the website, it should be in third person, not first person. They should lead with their strongest accolades first. Even if, that is, even if they won a local writing contest in their writer's group, that becomes award-winning author you know, Steve Barry or whatever. Um, they need a contact form on there so that readers can contact them. They need a series reading order. You'd be surprised how many authors don't put the reading order of their series on their website. And people like me, I'm an avid reader. I, I stop. Right. Uh, you want to have a new book on their homepage with the buy links. Again, you'd be surprised how many people leave those buy links off. And then you want to have the social media links and the newsletter sign up on each page of the website. So those are hey. kind of five quick things on the website, but very important things. What about the timing of the website? I, I talk to people who aren't sure, should I do it now? Till I, should I wait till I actually have a book to sell? What do you think? I would do it now. I would do it now. Um, and that brings up the couple things we talked about there, newsletter and, and social media. I would start the newsletter now. Um, it should be interesting. It should have exclusive content. Remember, a newsletter is more about more than just selling a book. It's about connecting. It's mm -hmm. the whole point of a newsletter. Even if you are, your authors are only doing it three times a year, four times a year, that's okay. Start building it now. Same thing with social media. If they're going to do one thing in social media, they don't have to do it all, but everyone should have a Facebook fan page, which is not a personal page. Right. And that Facebook, pan, Facebook, Facebook fan page should be the name of the author, not the series, not the book. Uh, because series change sometimes. So it needs to be mm -hmm. the author's name is branded. Um, social media can be overwhelming. Right. I would suggest just picking Facebook unless you're really into another mm -hmm. platform. And you want to use the 80-20 rule. So 80% of your posts and things like that are about not selling the book. They're about, about you, about interesting things maybe from the book, about interesting things that you're into, but not selling the book. And about 10 to 20% of your posts can be about selling the book or promoting the book. Um, and all three of those things, the website, the newsletter, and the Facebook fan page should all be branded the same. Font is important. Everything is important um, to that branding. Mm -hmm. That was one of the hardest things for me. You know, I've got all of the Facebook and newsletters, obviously. And whenever I start in a newsletter writing about, you know, me. Well, mm -hmm. last month, Laura and I went on a cruise and I just think, who cares? This is not. <laughs> but but your readers care, Bill. That's what they want. And if you had a picture of you and Laura, that's even better. Right. People, readers love that. I am such a fangirl. And when I get my author newsletters, I cherish them from the authors who are going to share things with me about themselves, maybe their research process, maybe they went on a cruise and there's a picture of, of them. That's what I love as a reader. Right, right. Hard lesson for me to learn though. Okay, what are the other things an author should have? Okay, so definitely they're going to need a Goodreads page. Really? Um, yeah. yeah, so you want to have a Goodreads profile. Make sure that bio is legit. You know, it's, it's up to date. Make sure you've kind of claimed all your books there. You're also going to want to have your Amazon page where your bio is there and it's correct and it's current and that you've claimed all your books. The same exact thing with BookBub. BookBub has become a big, big way for readers to find authors and for them to find new books. And as of right now, this could change. So, but as of right now, if you have a BookBub um, page presence and you have followers, when you have a new release come out, BookBub will send an email to those followers on your release day for free. Right. Big deal. There are, there are some book bub uh, promotions that you're not even eligible for in, until you have, say, a thousand followers or something. Exactly. Exactly. So build it early. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, more examples of those seven times, the, like we said, the, the Goodreads. Goodreads also does free promotions. You can purchase ads, but they do free promotions as well. We talked about that BookBub free email that they send on release day. Blogs, reaching out to blogs and um, giving them a value added and a mutually beneficial idea that works for them and that works for you. Not a generic letter to a blogger that, that those generic letters are not very nice, <laughs> but yeah. a sincere email to them that, that you follow the blog, you see what the blogger is into. May you suggest X, Y, Z. That's really cool. Uh, your social media, your newsletter events, swag, um, uh, the big thrill or book in Maine, some other publications per genre that are out there. That's, those are all examples of those seven times of someone seeing you and your book. Seven times before someone will be tempted to buy. Is that what you're saying? It's, it's a, it's a marketing rule. I mean, it's seven times seeing something before the reader or the, the user will possibly heed the call to action. So there's a lot of indirect marketing with this right. just because you advertise with a Facebook ad, let's say, and people aren't clicking on there to buy your book does not mean that the Facebook ad was a disaster. It means that you're just marketing to them and layering up those seven times to where finally, when maybe they, they see a good read data, they get that book bub mailer. That is the time that they purchase. It all is important. You know, I'm not sure I'd thought about it like that, but that makes a lot of sense. I know many times I'll have read about a book or for that matter, a television show or a movie and mm -hmm. first time think, yeah, but if it keeps coming up in what I'm yeah. reading, eventually I think, well, I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Disney world and places like that still advertise. Mm -hmm. Advertising is necessary and indirect that indirect marketing for when it's time for you to make the buying decision, you've got those layers of marketing that you, that have built in your brain subconsciously. It's important. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Amazon author page before. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed by how many people, people I know, people who are smart, who have never set that up, even though we're talking about basically a free profile on mm -hmm. the site where the vast plurality, if not yep. majority, of all books are sold. It frustrates me all the time when I see terrific authors and they don't have that Amazon page set up with their current bio, with their current picture, and with all of their books claimed. Mm -hmm. Amazon sends out free mailers to your followers it, for free. It's amazing that they do that. Um, give, <laughs> let them help you. <laughs> now, do you let, would you list, and here, here I'm really just thinking about, you know, people like me who've been doing this for 30 years and have all kinds of books, mm -hmm. would you say list them all or just list the ones that are in a series or in a particular genre? You know, Bill, I would claim every book that you have been a part of. I think that you don't want to underestimate what your reader is looking for. Mm -hmm. I know you've done writing books on writing. Well, what's to say that someone who's read 20 of your books doesn't want to say, you know what? I'm thinking about writing a book. Who should I go to for advice on writing? Oh my gosh, Bill Bernhardt has a book on writing. You just never know. So I would claim them all. I like that way of thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned Facebook. If you can only do one social media, and heaven knows nobody can do them all today. But right. why is Facebook numero uno for you? There have been several studies done, including a study that uh, the International Thriller Writers did with the Codex Group which is the kind of premier book researching company. And um, we pay quite a bit of money with ITW. Uh, you know, my other hat is I work with the International Thriller Writers. So we paid quite a bit of money to the Codex group to do a study on discoverability. How are readers finding authors? How are readers finding new books? And of all the social media, Facebook was so far above the rest, mm -hmm. it's comical. Uh, on the romance side of it, my company has also done a research study and the same thing. Of all the social media, Facebook is far and above. That's the place where readers are. So if you're going to have a presence, that's where you want to do it. The other thing about Facebook is you can't advertise there. And mm -hmm. you, you can't discount the impact that Facebook advertising can do. Mm -hmm. and, and you can target it as well. You can exactly. you know, pick mm -hmm. the demographics you want to reach up to. And in some ways, you can control it even better than Amazon advertising, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. And Facebook reps are, are willing to get on the phone with you and, and talk with you and help you through it. Uh, our Facebook rep is terrific. 
So yeah, they're, they're great. But, but even if you don't have a rep, Facebook kind of leads you through that demographic in a little bit easier way than the Amazon advertising does with their metadata. Right. Um, they, they both work. I'm not, not one's not better than the other, but if you're not used to doing any type of advertising, Facebook certainly leads you through it a little bit easier. No, I think I would agree with that. Okay. Have we gotten through your list? Uh, of yeah, <laughs> we got through my list. We got I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> yeah. you Let me tell you one more thing. Let me tell you the key elements to the brand of a book, because I think that your listeners might like this as well. There, there are a few key elements that they need to remember. Title, cover, right. cover copy, tagline, and price. That's what they need to be focused on. And I'm not going to let you off that easy. You mentioned <laughs> price. What's the right price? Since my husband is published by a wonderful New York publisher who has priced him um, quite aggressively, I, <laughs> I want to say that if you're not Steve Barry, yeah. because I, you know, but no, it, all joking aside. Or, it's, or to put it differently, if you're not with a traditional publisher, because we all know that they're pricing their eBooks way higher. Than they are. Else. They are. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you're saying, be doing. Yeah, you're saying it much better than I'm saying it. If you're not with a New York house who controls the pricing of the books, if you have any say in the pricing of your books, the, the sweet spot uh, for a novella is going to be that $299, $399 price point. And for a novel, it's going to be that $399, $499, $599 price price point. Um, maybe up to $7.99. What I would really encourage your listeners to do is study their genre and mm -hmm. see what their peers are pricing at and what the word count is for what they're pricing. Fantasy is going to be a 200,000 word book, whereas romance might be an 80,000 word book, whereas thriller might be a 110,000 word book. Price matters and seeing what your peers are pricing at really matters. If you're a new author, unless you're with a New York house, I would be very hesitant to price over about five ninety nine on a full novel. Right, if that, because your goal is if that, that if that, yeah, get readers. Yeah, I would be much more comfortable at that four ninety nine or even three ninety nine price point, depending on word count, page length. The thing that surprised me most is, if I remember right, you said for a novella, mm -hmm. which I'm guessing is maybe twenty thousand words. Am I right? Yeah, maybe twenty to forty thousand. The reason I say two ninety nine, Bill, is because. Yeah of the way the retailers pay out. If you're under 299, you're not going to get that 70% payout. Right. Um, it's going to be like, I think it's 35%, which really is tough to swallow. So my advice would be write, write the book a little bit longer. If you're hovering around that 20,000, get it up to 25, 30, you know, 35 mm -hmm. and charge the 299. If it's going to be much less, then go ahead and make it be less eight to 10 to 12,000 words. Call it a short story and charge 99 cents. <laughs> do you call the novellas novellas? If I went to the sales page for a yes, we do. Dark Nights book, would it say novella? They do. They all say novella so and they're all two ninety nine. Some people want something shorter. They do. Now, some of my writers um, write a little bit longer as my friend Lexi Blake says, she can't say hello in less than 10,000 words. So, <laughs> so all of the writers that, that write for us, they understand that we're going to price the book at two ninety nine. We tell them we don't care how long it is, but just know that this is where we're pricing the book. So we've got word counts anywhere from, you know, 22,000 words all the way up to God bless them, 70,000 words, you know, <laughs> which is certainly not a novella, but it's a little weird with our, structure. And I would not suggest that your listeners look at our word count as a whole and base word count on that. Novella length is somewhere between 20 to 40,000 words, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe 30, 20 to 35,000. If you're paranormal, it's going to be a little bit longer. You also mentioned covers. And for that matter, earlier you mentioned the Codex groups. You may or may not be aware of the, the study that recently came out from them on covers. Uh, mm -hmm. The Codex Group basically said, one, the most successful covers out there are coming from Amazon Publishing, not self-publishing, but their own publishing brand. Mm -hmm. And two, the most important thing on the cover was not the art, but the words, the lettering, mm -hmm. how the words were presented. Mm -hmm. that, Very important. Really? That's, Very, that, that it's, a, it, it's a multidimensional attack on the brain. Okay. Cause your brain sees the cover all at once and you're taking it all in. You're taking in the title, the artwork, the font, 
the way the letters are arranged, you're taking it all in at one time. So you can kind of see it in layers to some respect, right? So the, the first layer is, could be the author name of the title, but it's also maybe the second layer is those, the font, the way the words are positioned, or you can flip them. It depends on what side of the brain a person is. But then the artwork backs that up. If you stop longer than what, two seconds and look, then you're going to see the artwork. So that's important too. It's just kind of a layered approach. And then after that, if you're interested enough, you might look at either the tagline or you'll start to read the cover copy. So, and then your last deciding factor is going to be that price. Every, all of that is leaning you towards purchasing. And then you see it's a $25.99 ebook. (laughs) You're probably not going to click. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Liz, I know what's going to happen when this interview goes out. I'm going to get all this mail because everybody's going to want to hire you to be the <laughs> book marketing expert. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I, I just don't hire out. I love to do this. I love writers. Um, it's, it's such a passion of mine, but I'll make you a deal. If you get all those questions and requests, I'll, I'll ha- be happy to come back on and we'll do another session. How's that? Uh, that's a deal. Okay. I, I can't believe you didn't, you've only got like six jobs now. Why don't you right. want to do one? <laughs> Because it's you. I would do anything for you, Bill. You know that. Um, so no, I don't, I don't hire out. It's just, it's my passion. I think I was, one of the reasons I was put on this earth was to help lift writers up. And mm-hmm. I like to do that. No, you're doing a great job of it. Liz, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks again, Liz, for that terrific interview. Let me remind everyone, please, if you like this podcast, Leave a good rating, leave a good review wherever you get podcasts, Apple or Google or wherever it is. Those reviews really do make this podcast more searchable, more findable, so that other aspiring writers like perhaps you can listen to the podcast and benefit from what we're doing here. Until next time, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit.